Dr. Hani, you may start. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, uh, dear participants and panelists of this webinar. Welcome all. Uh, my name is Hayla Kabat. I will be your host for this event. This webinar is organized by Concerned Grand Canadians in Ottawa, uh, United Tagaro in Canada, and the Association of Tigray Communities in Canada. The title of the webinar is The War in Tigray and its National and Regional Implications. The main objective of the webinar is to examine the multidimensional implications of the war in Tigray. The human dis uh, displacement, suffering, and destruction it brings at a national level are crucial and inhumane. Among such cruelties and horrific acts, to name the most recent, is what just happened yesterday. The current Nobel Peace Prize recipient, leader of Ethiopia, bombarded civilians at a marketplace near Makala, reporting, uh, no, repeating what the like minded Derg leader Mangisto Haile Maram did at Housing Market on the 24th of July 1990, about 31 years ago. Similar atrocities at a national level, the spillover effects at a regional level, at least as already witnessed, and inter and intra-regional dynamics are either self-contained, are sorry, neither self-contained nor easily uh, stoppable. To examine such incidents uh, and intricacies, we have assembled a well-experienced and diverse panelists who will navigate through and expertly examine them in detail. We have attempted to ensure that the selection of the panelists and their focus will show the depth and scope of the implications of the war in Tigray. A more detailed bio of the panelists is included in the brochure, but please allow me to briefly introduce our distinguished panelists in the order that they will speak. First, We'll begin with a recording from the Honorable Anita Vanderbilt of Ottawa, Western European MP and Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of National Defense and Subcommittee on International Human Rights of the Standing Committee and Foreign Affairs and International Development. She couldn't join us as we speak due to previous commitments, but we are pleased and honored to open the webinar with her video recording. Her unambiguous stance on the atrocities taking place in Tigray when some political scientists in Canada are defending a government that is ordering such unheard of gang rape, killing of civilians and children. Thank you, Honorable Andrew, uh, Anita Vanderbilt, for your firm stance. This will be followed by Milita Gavromeskal, who will set the stage for us by focusing on the situation in Tigray. As someone who has spent more than two decades fighting for social justice and a trained journalist, Milita Gavromeskal will focus on the state of Tigray. Her expertise will outline the depth and the scope of the issues currently facing the people of Tigray and beyond. Following Milita's presentation, uh, Yosef Gavrayot will share with us the Eritrean perspective. Yosef Gavrayot has been a writer and an activist. He has been writing on the region in general and Eritrea in particular for the past 20 years. He probably is one of the few knowledgeable people in examining why the Eritrean president does what he does how the people in Eritrea lived and survived under Isaiah's rule for over 30 years, how they viewed Eritrea's involvement in the war in Tigray, and what the future holds for the two neighbors. Following Yosef, Dr. Heno Gabisa will provide an Oromo perspective. Dr. Heno Gabisa co-chairs International Oromo 
Lawyers Association, and is also a professor at Washington and Lee University School of Law. Coming from a region where a similar war with the federal government is going on, Dr. Heno Gabisa will give us a unique insight into the overall implications of the war in Tigray on Oromia, its people, and the potential for a joint effort to deal with a common enemy. Lastly, we have Professor Alex Dewal. He will share with us his perspective on, a, on the regional and international implications of the war in Tigray. Professor Alex Dual is an executive director of the World Peace Foundation and a research professor at the Fletcher School at Taft University. Professor Dual is considered one of the foremost experts on, on Sudan and the Horn of Africa. His expertise on the Horn of Africa in general and feminine in particular makes him an ideal expert to examine the man-made feminine being administered integrated by the Ethiopian government and analyze, analyze the inter and intra-regional dynamics of the war integrated. Welcome panelists. We are honored to have you all here today. Now, uh, let's just get started. And before I go to the panelists with us, uh, let's hear the Honorable MP's video keynote address and Giona will uh, share with us the MP's video. Thank you very much. There is no audio in this video. Sorry for the technical difficulties, everyone. Um, I think for now, let's move on to our first speaker and we can come back to the video later. Um, so let's go to Militsi Gamramaskal for our first speaker. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm Militsi Brahana Maskal. I'm a freelance journalist. Um, and I've been following what's happening in Ethiopia closely because my family is stuck there. <laughs> and uh, obviously that's important to me. So. I do want to talk specifically about what's happening in Tigray, but to get there, I think we need just a little bit of background on uh, Abiy Ahmed and what was happening just before he came in and then what occurred in uh, the years right before the war on Tigray. So as you all know, Abiy Ahmed was appointed prime minister in 2018. Uh, he was a relatively unknown member of the Oromo Democratic Party. And yes, he came up. Through EPRDF, he spent some time apparently um, in Tigray during the border war with Eritrea, um, apparently learned Tigrinya there. Um, and he was head of Ethiopia's infamous spy agency, right? But 
for all intents and purposes, he was really nobody and how he made it to the helm of what I think many would call a pretty chaotic country of 110 million people, more than 80 ethnic groups, just as many languages and cultures and all of that, we have to backtrack a little. So EPRDF, what is EPRDF? Um, the Ethiopian People's Revolutionary Democratic Front is a coalition or was a coalition, right? Of really carefully balanced semi-autonomous federal states. Many of these groups were historically oppressed, marginalized, enslaved, um, and definitely abused people in the history of Ethiopia. And so this federalist system was put in place to give these groups a sense of autonomy um, in their regions, but still keep everyone connected in this state called Ethiopia. It was, um, to so many people that I've spoke with, it was the only way really to keep Ethiopia together in 1991 when the Derg was defeated. And so of course TPLF played an outsized role in leadership uh, in the EPRDF because it played an outsized role in defeating the Derg. That federation survived almost three decades. And during that time, Ethiopia saw rapid development, massive infrastructure projects, really stunning economic success, um, and really came close to sort of banishing the image of a starving nation that can't even feed its own people, right? Um, mortality rates were decreased, people were living longer, women were birthing healthier babies, you could legally speak your own language now. There were lots of successes. Melesanawi, who was truly an Ethiopianist through and through, was really a brainchild behind a lot of the country's success. But he died suddenly in 2012. And his successor, his handpicked successor, uh, Haile Mariam Desaling, who is uh, of Walaita background from the Southern, from the people in uh, Southern Ethiopia, um, was met with a really uh, growing resistance that had been growing for some time. And that resistance came from Oromo youth, uh, who were really upset about a number of things. They were upset about the distribution of political power, um, the lack of personal economic power, and of course, the very, very controversial Addis Ababa master plan to expand the capital. So uh, Haile Mariam buckled under that pressure and he did what African leaders rarely do. He quit. <laughs> and so he left um, you know, this gaping leadership hole, right, in, in uh, EPRDF, and with the influence of international actors, including the United States, Abiy Ahmed comes to the scene. And Abiy Ahmed is considered the perfect candidate. He's apparently, or said to be, half Oromo, half Amhara. He's supposed to be a Pentecostal Christian, and yet he had Muslim parents. So he represented, like, this perception or idea of the perfect Ethiopian, who's like this blend of cultures and blend of religions and um, doesn't belong to any one group. So he comes into power and he's given credit for all of these sweeping reforms in the country. And the truth is those reforms were already agreed upon in the parliament before Abiy Ahmed was even selected as the next leader, but he's given credit for those things because he's in charge when it happens. So he does things like release political prisoners and start to liberalize the economy. Those are all good things. However, there was a problem. Abiy Ahmed rode in on the backs of Oromo youth and the Cairo movement. And to the surprise of many of those leaders, Abiy turned out to be an anti-federalist who was looking to re-centralize power. And so that is a huge red flag to minority ethnic groups throughout the country who have fought time and time and time again for self-determination. In fact, the Cairo leader, the Cairo movement leader, Jawar Mohammed, who is a staunch pro-federalist, um, and was an Abiy supporter initially, was jailed and is still in jail. So I think, you know, that's an interesting sort of thing to point out. So Abiy comes to power and he turns on his base, right? Because he's relatively unknown. Now this is his base. He turns on them and he immediately begins to vilify Tigrayans. There, if you remember, there was an alleged assassination attempt on his life in June of 2018, shortly after he's brought into power. And the crowd immediately begins to chant, down, down, Weyane, not down, down, TPLF, not down, down, a specific person, Getacho Asafa. No, it's down, down, Weyane. 
Wayana means revolution and has deep historical uh, meaning for Tigrayans who are constantly fighting for their existence from tyrants in, in Aretkilo, <laughs> um, who are constantly trying to subjugate them. So by the way, five non-Tigrayans were later quietly convicted for that attempted assassination, but Abi never comes back to clear that up and, uh, and sort of make it clear that Tigrayans were not behind that assassination attempt. He just allows the people to believe that Tigrayans were behind it. So that incident is followed by major chaos in the country, throughout the country. There's ethnic fighting everywhere. Every day you're hearing about people being killed, you know, people being attacked in churches. The jails are filled up again. Journalists are being cornered again. 1.4 million people are internally displaced within the first three months of Abi's tenure. And that grows to 2 million by the end of 2018, more than anywhere else in the world, more than Syria. You have more displaced people in Ethiopia. So true to nature, Abi starts this whirlwind of activities. He topples the Somali president. He purges Tigrayans from literally every post in the country and worldwide, essentially blaming them for everything wrong in Ethiopia. He tries to consolidate federal bases um, and the military chief, the head of the Ethiopian National Defense Forces, the Tigrayan, General Saare is killed. That's a big deal. No one has been uh, found guilty of that either. There's been no justice in that. So he also forms the Prosperity Party. And of course, there's the peace deal with Isaiah Safawerki, with details that till today, no one has ever seen. So we have no idea what the details are of that peace agreement. And shockingly, Abi gets a Nobel Peace Prize for his peace agreement with Isaiah Safawerki. Well, it turns out that that peace agreement was actually a war pact, but it gave Abi a long leash as the human rights violations continued to mount. And something else was happening in the economy. You, you have citizens who are now not being protected by their government, but now there's the uncertainty of being able to even feed your families because the Ethiopian economy is taking a nosedive. So you go from double digit growth to 1.9% in 2020. So Abi's popularity starts to wane and he needs a boost. So what does he do? He can't go into an election now. So he postpones the election conveniently using COVID, even though COVID was virtually non-existent, right? He does this because he needs to buy time. And what does he do? He reverts to what worked for him in the past. He blames TPLF for all of his leadership failures. But at this point, Tigray has held an election now. This is a problem because it makes Abi look incompetent, right? And now you've got the people you're lab labeling as terrorists holding an election. So this is, a, this is a huge problem. So what does Abi do? He continues with the microaggressions that have been happening over the past two years. They didn't just start overnight. He denies Tigray their budget allowances. He denies Tigray the tools needed to fight the massive locust invasion that the farmers were dealing with. He denies masks, COVID masks to Tigray. And, and he starts to take Isaiah Safawarki on tours of bases that the average Ethiopian cannot get access to. You'll remember that the late C.U. Mesfin, may he rest in peace, was talking about this in October. He, he was talking about Abi's trip to Asmara. He was talking about the fact that Eritrean troops were stationed in the Northwest Amhara region at that time. So they were blowing the whistle and they were trying to alert the world of what was happening. And of course, that's when Isaias and various people in Eritrean leadership begin using the game over statement. So um, shortly after that, the war breaks and we're given the excuse that a Northern base was attacked and Abi was provoked by the TPLF. He had no choice, he had to go to war. Of course, we know that's not true in hindsight. We knew it then, but we know it in hindsight now. Um, in particular, there was a New York Times article that came out just this last week where Senator Coons was quoted saying that before the war started, he had a conversation with Abi. And in that conversation, he's trying to de-escalate and convince Abi that war is not the answer. And Abi is completely undeterred and says, no, I got this. I can defeat the TPLF and I can do this in six weeks. Not a single person will be hurt. 
um, and he moves forward with the war on Tigray. But before that, he formally labels TPL off a terrorist group within the parliament, and then they attack Tigray on election night in the United States. So here we are, more than seven months into the most brutal, the most secretive war anywhere in the world. As you know, telecom was cut, internet was cut, Basic, basic services were cut from electricity to running water, hospitals are looted, pharmacies are looted, factories are destroyed, religious and historical sites are bombed or looted or destroyed, and Eritrean soldiers go door to door looting to grind families of everything from electronics to furniture to you know, gold to food and livestock. Anything they can't take, they slaughter or burn. We know that there have been more than 30 massacres reported where Tigrayans were slaughtered by Ethiopian, Amhara, or Eritrean soldiers. The most talked about are in Maikadra in Western Tigray, uh, which is a brutal massacre with machetes and just really horrible things. Uh, there's the massacre in or outside of St. Mary's Church in Aksum. There's a massacre at Mariam Dengelet during the ceremony. There's the uh, Mahabaradego, where the boys were shot and thrown over cliffs. More than 2 million Tagaru are internally, internally displaced, displaced within Tigray. More than 70,000 refugees are in Sudan. All of Western Tigray is completely ethnically cleansed. And there are questions, lots of questions about what happened to those communities. I mean, it's over a million people. Are they, are they among those who were displaced? I know there are some in Sudan because I met many, or were they killed? Are they dead? I mean, there are just so many questions around what happened to the people of Western Tigray. I personally traveled to Sudan and heard harrowing stories from refugees. So when I went, remember, we still didn't have journalists. We still didn't have access to Tigray at that time. There was a, it, this was in January, February. And so I was hearing stories firsthand that seemed incredibly unbelievable. And it was the first time we were hearing a lot of that stuff. And of course, now it's become the norm. I spoke with refugees who saw dead bodies with limbs hacked off, people they knew and people they recognized, their friends, their family. I met someone whose ear was chopped off by Amhara militia. It's kind of a, a militia like gangster group called Fano. And there's another one called Salug. I met people who were stabbed by machete repeatedly, repeatedly hacked and somehow survived. They were thrown into the streets and somehow survived that. Imagine that with no medical, no hospitals, nothing. I met, I met young boys who hid when soldiers were going door to door looking for young boys to execute. They were executing them because they didn't want them to grow up, become men and seek revenge for what they saw happening to their families. I met young people who saw their mother killed before their eyes just horrendous and horrific things that happened to the people of Tigray. The UN humanitarian chief, Mark Lokak, told um, the G7 group that there is famine in Tigray now. And I was hearing that from refugees at that time in Sudan when they were saying, worse than the hacking is the hunger. People are hungry. And so we're told now that there is famine in Tigray now. The number that we keep hearing is 350,000 people are in famine. But we know the number is greater, and we know that 5.2 million people are at risk of dying of starvation. That's close to 90% of the Tigrayan population. However, rather than respond to this and, and attempt to protect the people or clean it up, Abi instead has allowed the weaponization of food, creating roadblocks for humanitarians, aid workers, allowing soldiers to divert aid, which is another story we heard again and again in in Sudan, nine humanitarian aid workers have been killed since the war on Tigray started. Samantha Powers of USAID publicly said that the Ethiopian government is complicit. The Ethiopian government has contributed to unsafe conditions for aid workers. But I have to say, all of that is horrendous and horrific, but perhaps even more disturbing is how this war is being played out on the bodies of young girls, women, and elderly women. The youngest rape victim on record is four years old. The oldest rape victim on record is 89 years old. 
Soldiers are making comments such as, we are amharanizing your blood as they gang rape women. I heard a story of an HIV positive woman in Mekala who tried to warn the soldiers before they gang raped her of her condition, but they raped her anyway without protection, gang raped her and said that if she really is HIV positive, then it will just help them spread the disease when they rape again. A 70 year old woman pled with soldiers. She begged them and told them, I am your mother. I could be your mother. But they continued to gang rape her and they refused to stop. Her 65 year old neighbor heard her screams and came to help her and was also raped. I had a conversation with the former UN chief in Sudan, the human a humanitarian, a whistleblower in Darfur, Dr. Mukesh Kapila who has spent a lifetime studying and fighting genocide in the world. And he said, every genocide has a signature and the signature in Tigray is sexual violence. The assault on women is being called genocidal rape as women's internal organs are being completely destroyed. So when Abi was confronted on this topic, you'll remember he finally relented and finally admitted that there was rape. And that was after the president um, um, Sahla, Sahla work went to Tigray and visited, you know, some of the um, safe, one of the safe houses in Mekala. And she came back and that's when they began to admit that there is a problem, not the extent, not the full extent, but they at least were admitting that something was going on. And his very cold reply, if you remember, was these women have only been penetrated by men, whereas our soldiers were penetrated by bayonets. That was his response. And he was referring to the so-called base attack, which he says forced him to go to war with Tigray. That was his cold and callous response to what's happening to women in Tigray. So the violations of international law in Tigray are textbook. There's no question about it. And the former special rep to the UN, Rachel Kite, uh, with the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy said, the world knows enough to say that crimes are happening in Tigray. We should not wait until we are able to conduct full and thorough investigations before we act to stop rape as a weapon of war. We should not have to count the graves of children before we act to stop starvation crimes. Ethiopia will continue to rebuke every report from CNN to The Guardian to Human Rights Watch to Amnesty International. The government officials continue to tweet. They call it fake news. They call it a Western smear campaign. They say people are interfering with their sovereignty. But the truth is, it's just getting harder and harder for them to hide the crimes. With every new massacre, every new photograph, all of the video evidence, the satellite imagery, the survivor testimony, they just can't hide anymore. So to quote Linda Thomas Greenfield, we have to act now. Do African lives not matter? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Diana? If it's ready, uh, is it the video ready now or uh, do we still have to continue with the uh, panelists? Let's continue with the panelists. We'll try the video again at the Can end. Can I try it from my end? Can I try it if it works? If you'd like to. Dr. Haile, let's play it after Yosef Gebrehua gets a chance to speak. Okay, I think okay. that'll be better. Yes, go ahead, uh, uh, Mr. Yosef Gebrehua. Please go ahead. Oh, this is okay. Uh, <clears throat> okay, then. Uh, uh, thank you for inviting me, first of all, uh, to this uh, uh, panel discussion. Uh, since Eritrea is uh, at the center of it all, uh, this would be a, a vast subject matter. Uh, not only because uh, Eritrea will be will be impacted in a huge way in huge ways uh, uh, in the future, but also on how it has impacted Tigray, uh, in particular uh, Ethiopia uh, and the region in general. So, since it's a very uh, vast subject matter, I will confine myself only to two points. Uh, uh, in, in a way, what I'm going to say is that Eritrea has given a gift in the negative sense, of course, uh, 
two big gifts to the region as a result of this war. The first one is the making of the alliance of dictatorships in the region. When I'm saying the making of an alliance, I mean an alliance that's made for the sole purpose of maintaining their dictatorships in their respective countries. If any one of those dictatorships is in danger as a result of internal uh, or external cause, for example, an internal uprising or external pressure, then they intend to rush to each other's help. What this shows is this alliance is solely made for the sole purpose uh, of maintaining dictatorship. Now, why is this unique in this, in this area? Why do I call this a gift that Eritrea has given to this area? Because it's unique for two reasons. One, it's a brand new uh, in Africa. There has never been an, an alliance of dictatorships in Africa before. We know that since the heyday of independence in the 60s, uh, Africa had its share of dictators. But those dictators, they might sympathize with each other, but they have never made an alliance the way we are seeing it now, one that includes a military alliance. In the old days, they did, the dictators used to get their support and protection, even their very existence depended on the superpowers. For example, Mengistu Haile Mariam of Ethiopia depended on the Soviet Union. Mobutu Seseko of Congo depended on the Western powers. But, but after the binary world came to an end, after the fall of the uh, Soviet Union, uh, dictators were in trouble because they couldn't find somebody that could sponsor them, that could support them. This is the first time in Africa, this is the first time that dictators have formed an alliance in support of one another. Of course, uh, the primary uh, aim of this alliance is uh, to subvert any kind of democracy in that area. If they see any place, uh, democracy uh, surviving in that area, then they have to wipe it out. Uh, it's, you could easily see, for example, uh, let me give you this example. The Somalis, uh, thousands of Somalis have been trained in Eritrea in order to participate in a war in Tigray. You could see the link from Somalia to Eritrea to Tigray. All of this is meant to kept the dictatorship in Ethiopia, in Eritrea, and in Somalia. Now, the other part of this, what makes it unique, this alliance of dictatorship is that, you know, as you know, dictatorship is not an ideology. Usually, when alliances are formed, uh, they are formed because they have either ideological or principle-wise or religious-wise, they have something in common that holds them together. For example, NATO, uh, the, uh, the old Warsaw Pact, or even the Arab League, there is something in common be it ideology, religion, or uh, even ethnic group that makes, that holds them together. But dictatorships have nothing in common that way. For example, they come in various shapes and uh, uh, forms. Uh, you have a religious dictatorship in, in the Ayatollah, for example, the Ayatollahs of uh, Iran. You have a military dictatorship in Pinochet of Chile. You have a secular dictatorship in Idi Amin of Uganda. You have a right-wing dictatorship. You have a left-wing dictatorship. You have a nationalist dictatorship as, as, as the one in Eritrea. There is nothing in common that holds all of this together except for the fact that they are dictatorships. So they are only linked at the meta level, at the fact that they are dictatorships. Now, think about this. The ones that the, this alliance that is evolving in the Horn of Africa, uh, look at it this way. Uh, they could even op have opposing views on their ideology, even as they uh, gang up together against any kind of democracy. For example, uh, evangelicalism uh, has been a growing political force in the world 
as we have seen it, for example, in the United States, uh, as it is also the case, for example, the primary example would be Brazil uh, with uh, Bolsonaro and the evangelical groups. In Ethiopia also, evangelicalism has been growing in leaps and bounds. And it has a big role in maintaining uh, uh, Abi at the position that he is right now. Even the word prosperity church, uh, I mean prosperity party comes from the prosperity church. Now think about this. When it comes to evangelicalism, Eritrea and Ethiopia are at the opposite ends. While Abi thrives in evangelicalism and depends on evangelicalism to support his dictatorship, his, his emerging dictatorship, in Eritrea, evangelicalism is considered to be a threat to the totalitarian system in Eritrea. Eritrea has wiped out evangelicalism. Uh, I mean, the Eritrean government has wiped out evangelicalism from the Eritrean scene. It has outlawed, legally outlawed evangelical churches, closed them, and even uh, imprisoned thousands of them. Yet, look at this. Both uh, these nations, these two nations, that, that, that we find at the opposite end of one another when it comes to the evangelical church, they have decided to make a pact to protect each other's dictatorship. That shows you the sole purpose of their, uh, of their alliance is to maintain that dictatorship. Now, I'm coming back to Eritrea because this is a gift that Eritrea gave to the Horn of Africa. Because this is the brainchild of Isaias Aforki of uh, Eritrea. He created this out of necessity. Eritrea has been a totalitarian system for the last 30 years. Sorry, it has closed the country. It has, in fact, sealed off the country for 30 years. And it has realized that it has come to a dead end in various ways. One is demographically. It has been, uh, a mil I mean, it's almost a million people have, have, uh, uh, have uh, a million refugees have fled the country economically and politically. All of the, in all, in all uh, uh, measurements, Eritrea have come to a dead end. It's at this time that Abiy of Ethiopia showed up. Now, look at this. While the West saw in Abi a reformer, a democrat, and a peacemaker, Isaias never made that mistake. The first time he met him, he sized it up correctly. He saw in Abi the making of a dictator, the making of a tyrant, and he grabbed that opportunity to make an alliance of dictatorship with Abi, later to be added with. Uh, uh, for Maju of uh, Somalia. And I'm sure they would have added up South Sudan and North Sudan had it not been uh, for the dispute, for the border dispute, for the border and the uh, Nile Dam uh, dispute. So uh, this is what they came up, uh, where Tigray comes into the picture. Tigray was seen both by the Abiy government and by uh, uh, by the uh, Eritrean totalitarian system to be on the way, on the way of dictatorship, on the way of the making of dictatorship in Ethiopia, and on the way of maintaining uh, the totalitarian system in Eritrea. And therefore, Tigray has to go. Tigray has to be subdued. Of course, uh, there is various reasons for that one I can't go on all over the details, but if I can keep, if I can talk only about the demography, for example, uh, in, in Tigray, there were about 100,000 refugees in Tigray, Eritrean refugees in Tigray. Tigray was uh, working as a magnet, as a magnet for uh, Eritreans. Uh, so there were more than 100,000 refugees. There were thousands, tens of thousands more living in Tigrayan cities and towns. And more importantly, hundreds of thousands of refugees have gone through Tigray to different parts of the world. So for Eritrea, this was an existential threat. If it has to stop 
this bleeding, this bleed, this demographic ble bleeding, it has to destroy the guy. That's one of the reasons. There are other th reasons like uh, it was a threat to Eritrean nationalism. It was a threat to the Eritrean uh, economy. I could not, I, I, I am not gonna go uh, over all this uh, uh, in details, but you could see that both Eritrea and uh, 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 Ethiopia saw Tigray uh, as an obstruction uh, to the kind of dictatorship that was emerging, to the kind of alliance of dictatorship that was emerging in that country. The other gift that Eritrea gave to the, to the region is uh, the death of the nation. The, when I mean the death of the nation, it means the undermining of the concept of sovereignty in that area. It, of course, it's, it started long before that with the fracturing of Somalia. But now with the Tigray war, we see, for example, in Ethiopia, three ways it has been undermined, uh, how the sovereignty has been undermined. Number one, it's the obvious way that we all know uh, with the uh, invitation of uh, uh, Eritrea, uh, Somalia, and also uh, what you call the uh, United Arab Emirates. Uh, that's number one, how Ethiopia's sovereignty was compromised. The second is uh, with the sub, with the elevation of the sub-national entities like Amhara Kalil or any other Kalil uh, to the level of nationhood in this war. The Amhara uh, Kalil, for example, had its own professional army. But that's not the point. The point is that it was fighting for its own interest, independent of the national interest. That means undermining nationhood in a very big way. The third one is the way the borders have been working inside Ethiopia and uh, uh, internally and outside. For example, in Ethiopia right now, a lot of emotions are being whipped up. If the border in the borders between the regions inside Ethiopia, more than uh, what should have been whipped up when, when there is a problem, border problem between Sudan and Ethiopia. In, uh, the people are mute when it comes to, be to, to, the, to, the, to the border dispute between Ethiopia and Sudan, but they are very emotional when it comes, for example, between uh, Afar and uh, uh, Somalia Kalil, or between Tigray and Amhara, or between uh, uh, Oromo uh, and Somal Somali Kalil. So what we are seeing is again the uh, the undermining of nationhood uh, in the region. But since this is the gift, uh, the gift given by Eritrea, I need to talk a little bit before I close this uh, uh, speech. I need to talk a little bit of of uh, Eritrea. Eritrea. Uh, the moment Eritrea invaded uh, Tigray, uh, invaded the sovereignty of Tigray, it has left itself open to future attacks on its sovereignty. Uh, I'm sure today uh, we'll hear the developments uh, of war in Tigray uh, from Alex Dual, uh, but uh, the way it's moving, I'm sure that uh, sooner or later, uh, the war in Tigray is not gonna be kept inside Tigray only. Already, it has been overflowing uh, in uh, Amhara areas. And uh, I'm sure that sooner or later, it will also happen in the soil, in the Eritrean soil, in the Eritrean soil. Now, what would be the impact of, uh, 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 of this on the Eritrean, on the concept of Eritrean sovereignty? First of all, Eritrea is not as united as Tigray. Tigray, more or less, the, it's a homogeneous people. Uh, more than 90% speak Tigrinya. Uh, they have one religion. They have one language. So more or less, uh, it's a very cohesive uh, society that has rose up against the existential uh, threat unanimously. Nothing like that will happen in Eritrea. Eritrea uh, is more or less like Ethiopia. With uh, that small area, there are nine ethnic groups, two different religions, uh, almost 50-50, Islam and uh, uh, Christianity, and with different loyal loyalties, with sub-national and cross-national loyalties. 
For example, that small trip in Dunkel, in Dunkalia, that sm small trip of land that you see, uh, the Afars over there have more affinity with the Afars on the Ethiopian side than with the rest of Eritrea. So is it with the Western part of Eritrea. The various ethnic groups, Muslim ethnic groups that you find on, uh, in Western Eritrea, they feel more uh, affinity with their kins in Sudan than with the rest of uh, Eritrea. And so is it with, as it is turning out, so is it also with the middle part of Eritrea, the Tigrinya speaking uh, part of Eritrea. Many people are now identifying with Tigray rather than with the rest of Eritrea. So the very idea of a nationhood that, uh, that Eritrea set out to destroy in other parts of the, of the, of the region is also haunting it back uh, to destroy the very idea of sovere sovereignty in its own uh, country. I think I'm uh, out of uh, time, I guess, uh, uh, but uh, uh, all that I, I, will, I will sum it up by saying that there is a connection uh, between the two gifts that Eritrea ga gave to the, to the region. That is uh, the alliance of dictatorships and the death of nationhood are intimately tied together. When you could invite any, any nation in order to stifle out uh, any resistance inside the country, then you, are, you have already killed the idea of nationhood. So I, I will uh, just end it uh, uh, that way. I hope uh, uh, it makes a little bit of sense. Uh, thank you, guys. <laughs> okay. Uh, Thank you. Thank you, Yosef. Uh, you are almost on time and we didn't uh, waste any additional time. So, uh, with over, if the video is not still ready, we'll go just directly to Dr. Heno. Gabisa, and then he will give us the uh, Oromo perspective on the issue. Thank you, uh, Dr. Heno. Thank you all for uh, inviting me here. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, share uh, some of the perspective from the other uh, side of, uh, of uh, the struggle. Uh, I was tasked to speak on the Oromo perspective of uh, how the war in Tigray is viewed and what it means uh, to be in the current situation and the uh, affairs in the Oromo uh, nation at the moment. Uh, along that line, I was also asked to uh, speak on uh, the possible uh, room for alliances and partnership uh, between these two uh, nations who are apparently engaged in a fight against uh, brutal centralization of power. So I am going to reflect on uh, these questions and uh, related issues. First of all, the starting point of thesis for the Oromo national struggle is that the state of Ethiopia was built and continue to exist on the blood and sweat of the peripheries or nations who demanded uh, an effective and meaningful self-determination or self-governance. And that's, uh, if we just go back a few uh, decades and see the Ethiopian political history, we realize that the way uh, the, peripheries was, uh, the peripheries were forced to come together followed its own unique and brutal state ideology uh, which actually is common to many nation state building process. But what's so different in Ethiopia is that the, the more the state of Ethiopia continue to exist, the more it demands blood and sweat of the peripheries. Most nations were built on, uh, uh, on the base of war and brutality and even to some extent on genocide. But what makes them so different is that they take a national measure to redress and readdress uh, the fault lines that brought to, uh, that brought them into existence. But what we saw in Ethiopia is that the more Ethiopian state attempts to continue itself, the more it has to uh, suppress and oppress or forcefully assimilate the peripheries, uh, 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 the periphery communities. So this had continued to be the main fault line in the continuance of the state. So on that thesis, the Oromo national struggle is uh, to create a platform for the Oromo people in which these people would be asked what is it that they want 
in that political territory. So up until today, since 1973, especially in the contemporary Oromo national struggle that had been led by the Oromo Liberation Front, the, uh, the equivalent of the uh, TPLF in Oromia, uh, that opportunity had not been materialized. There had been gaps uh, from time to time. When those gaps appear, it's possible that people like Abi, as uh, one of our colleagues earlier uh, was addressing, uh, who had the chance to write uh, the true legitimate demand of the youth and the people of Oromo come to the helm of the power and then re, uh, uh, re uh, uh, enforce the imperial uh, state ideology that had been the original scene in that country. So briefly, that is where the Oromo national struggle starts from. It's with that mentality and psychological consciousness that the Oromo national struggle uh, continue to exist. So apparently the Oromo national struggle has three fundamental uh, leadership sources. The first one is the uh, nonviolent youth movement, which had the face of the 2014, 15, 16, and 18 resistance, whose leadership are currently uh, confined and arrested and detained in Kaliti. And the second uh, wing of the Oromo national struggle is the armed struggle, which is being led by the Oromo Liberation Army, mostly uh, uh, concentrated on south, uh, southwest, uh, west part of Oromia, and now uh, uh, continuing to be present in the central part of, of, uh, of Oromia, including in Salale, in, uh, uh, in, in, in Ambo areas. And the third uh, wing or center of the Oromo leadership is the uh, the seasoned or the veteran, uh, the veteran leadership like Marara Gudina, Professor Marara Gudina and Daud Ifsa, who are in Addis, but in house arrest. So for us to understand the Roman national struggle, we need to just understand all these wings and centers of leadership. Uh, now, having said this, uh, when Abiy Ahmed came to power in April, 2018, uh, which he uh, wrote in the back of the Oromo use, all of us, uh, including the uh, Tigray people, the Amara, the Oromo, and the international community uh, were naively hoping that this guy can be really a, a guy who can be accepted across the aisle. And he was given the benefit of the doubt, but little did we know that he was uh, preparing himself uh, for the reinforcement of the imperial uh, type of state that had been uh, the original scene or the original problem. So uh, in June 29, uh, on June 29, 2020, with the killing of the most uh, populous Ethiopian artist, Hajalu Undesa, and then the killing of over 600 Oromo youths who protested that killing. And the following day with the arrest and detention of, uh, of uh, the youth leadership, uh, such as Jawar Mohammed, uh, Bakale Garba and others, uh, sent a signal, uh, a clear signal that clarified where uh, Abi was uh, or is taking uh, uh, the, the country. In fact, we were very much aware of uh, how and what he was planning. Uh, if uh, I'm sure all of you might remember when uh, people like Bakale Garba traveled to Makale, uh, trying to uh, reach out to what's uh, to the leadership in Tigray and find if there is a way uh, to continue to uh, uh, bring uh, leadership together. And one of the main reasons why these people were targeted were in fact that they uh, took the audacity to reach out to Tigray, Tigray that had been secluded already, Tigray that had been blocked from the center already, uh, and, and people like uh, uh, Jawar and Bakale and Marag now are saying that we're saying that unless the guy comes on board and be part of this reform, there is no way we can address and we can transition uh, this troubled uh, country. And that had been the biggest flag that put them uh, in jail up until today. Now, the war in Tigray is being viewed by the Oromo people as a war that's extremely grounded in an ideology. It's not a spontaneous action of military uh, uh, war in Tigray. It's in fact a war that started two years ago against the Oromo people. And I'm sure to what extent we are aware of the fact that uh, Abi had tried 
an aerial bombing or uh, airstrike, uh, airstrike against uh, the Oromo National, uh, the Oromo Liberation Army in Wolaga area two years ago. Uh, this had been uh, reported by uh, news uh, organizations like this standard and even was admitted by the chief of staff uh, back then. So for Abi, uh, when he uh, uh, defined the enemy of the state, who are the enemy of the, the enemy of the state? For Abi, the enemy of the, the, enemy of the state uh, is any entity that seeks to reclaim or demand a constitutional and legal right to self-determination. Abi had always believed that the Oromo nationalism or the Tigrayan nationalism, which actually doesn't mean anything else ex except being uh, a locally autonomous region or uh, a, a self-sustained uh, member of the Federation. So Abi defined the enemy of the state as those entities uh, who seek a, uh, a regional autonomy and effective self-determination, whether that's from Tigray or from the Oromia or from Sidama or from any, uh, anywhere else, even including the Amara itself. So now with that kind of political definition of the animosity, uh, Abi decided to uh, enter into a formal military war or military action against Tigray. A few days before the declaration of war uh, we remember that in Guliso, which is the Western part of Oromia, there was a narrative that has been perpetrated by the Ethiopian government, by Abi administration, as if 54 Amara people were killed by the Oromo Liberation Army, and this Oromo Liberation Army had been supported materially by the TPLF. Up until today, there was no single evidence of the killing of 54 Amaras in Oromia. So when he went to Tigray for war, the pretext for the war actually came from Oromia. That's, that's something that teaches us that the ideological source, the ideological source of this war is grounded in one and one only source. That is to maintain and continue to maintain the brutal assimilationist Ethiopian state ideology. So that's how we can understand the alliance uh, that could also exist or that could possibly come out of the, uh, uh, the partnership of the groups who are fighting for their existence, which include the Tigray and the Oromo. Uh, now, when the war was declared, the first group of people who stood up against that very uh, uh, declaration of war was the Oromo people, whether that's on social media, or whether that's through the Oromo political parties or in the diaspora. And we believed that this is the duty of any human person to oppose this war because the way Abi was mobilizing the urbanite people in, in, in Addis Ababa was completely based on anti-Tigray ethnicity. And he made sure that he tapped into the pre-existing political difficulty of the last 27 years. And all of us do agree that even though the last 27 years had seen uh, uh, a, a meaningful economic progress, the way the economy was progressing in the country and the political difficulty had its own fault lines. So we can call this the political uh, difficulty of the last 27 years that had not been addressed. Our society everywhere in Ethiopia are uh, uh, still societies that had to deal with uh, uh, reconciliation, uh, rehabilitation in, in a way that's meaningful to them. And that did not happen. So that had opened for Abi a way to tap into anti-Tigray anti sentiment. So now, having said this, what would be the possible uh, uh, platform or outcome that these two nations uh, can, uh, can operate together. The existence of the Tigray people is now obviously in question. The genocide, crime against humanity that's taking place in Tigray is silently taking place in Oromia. So there has to be a systematic and strategic information exchange. There has to be uh, uh, a way to start to think about the future political settlement. 
And at the end, the belief is that if Tigray or no, not Tigray, if EPRDF had the chance to build a successful federal state, Tigray probably could not have been in the current situation. There would have been a chance to protect the peripheries that includes the cry against the force of the center. So we probably need to go back to the national drawing board where we probably need to go back to the national drawing board where we have to jointly think about the future political settlement. I know this is a very difficult scenario or situation, especially for Tigray. The urgency right now is the humanitarian disaster. The urgency right now is to maintain and to protect uh, the women and the young girls who are being raped by the Ethiopian military forces and by the Eritrean forces. But while we have to deal with this urgency, it's also time to learn from the 1990s transitional period and start to have a meeting of mind between these two societies to at least uh, 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 find a future political settlement that can work for the Oromia, for Tigray, and for the entire people. Once that, that determination has been made, it got to be the household discussion between uh, all uh, nations and nationalities. Unless the multinational federal system in that country is maintained, more irredeemable damage are going to be happening. What fears me a lot, or what really scares me a lot is that we probably might be seeing more, more harm and more blood buzz in that country than what we are seeing right now. Abi is a type of human being who overcame his human fear. A person who overcame his human fear has no boundary. Anything can happen beyond genocide, which is already happening actually. So that's the fear. And if this fear can be addressed collectively, there might be a glimmer of hope. There might be a light at the end of the channel, uh, uh, the tunnel. And that's uh, where I conclude my presentation. Uh, thank you very much again. Sorry, Dr. Haile, we can't hear you. Now, uh, can you hear me now? Okay, thank you. Uh, now, uh, I think we'll try the video at the end. So let me go to uh, Professor Alex Joel. Uh, probably with more interesting information and analysis. And I'm sure it's going to be uh, a good appetite for all the listeners who probably want to hear more about uh, the issues. So Professor uh, Alex Dual, please take the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for organizing this. Um, I hope that the government of Canada will join with the other members of the transatlantic alliance in a common analysis of the uh, the ethio-eritrean conflict in tigray and the national crises in both ethiopia and eritrea and i hope that that can lead to to action let me start off by um telling you my understanding of the current situation i'm sure you are all following the the news Although it, it is remarkable how, um, as Milete pointed out, how little media coverage there has been of the crisis and especially how little media coverage there has been of the war. It is almost as though the, the presumption of the Ethiopian government that the, the war is a minor affair, just a few remnants of, of, of a guerrilla struggle that will easily be overcome has been accepted. This is not the case, I mean, as we all know, this is actually a, a major conventional military war. It was not the case a few months ago. A few months ago, the Tigray Defense Forces were on the run. They were, as, as General Tzadkan said, you know, biting the dust. But um, they have uh, got up from the dust and in a matter of uh, four or five months, they have got to the stage where they have inflicted irreparable military defeats on the Ethiopian National Defense Forces. Now, one of the things that I find interesting about the context of this internationally is that 
Um, every international intelligence analyst agrees with what I'm about to tell you. And they all agree that the information that, that has been provided from by members of the of the um, of the uh, of, of, of the uh, Tigray resistance has been unfailingly reliable, unfailingly you know, correct in its uh, analysis. Um, if you will excuse me for one moment, this is actually a call from Tigray. Let me just take it for one, and I, I will ask. Oh no, I've missed it. Sorry. Um, no worries. No, worries. no I, I, I missed it. If it calls back, I will, I, 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 I will, I will interrupt just for one moment. Um, in the last um, seven days, the Tigray resistance has completely eliminated five divisions of the Ethiopian National Defense Forces. Uh, Oh, it's going back one moment. Okay. Not a problem. In the meantime, let us uh, play the video from our MP. Um, Fana, can you take that away, please? I'm Anita Vandenbelt, Member of Parliament for Ottawa West Nepean, and I'm pleased to provide remarks today to concerned Canadian Tigrayans in Ottawa for your webinar. I'm very pleased that you're doing a webinar on this issue, as it's one of the most serious and deteriorating situations in the world right now. I recently stood up in the House of Commons to bring attention to the deteriorating situation in the Tigray region of Ethiopia. We know that over 2 million people have been displaced and that there are extrajudicial killings, sexual violence, and serious human rights abuses taking place right now. I called on the Ethiopian government to hold those responsible accountable and for an immediate ceasefire. We hear from the United Nations that over 90% of the Tigrayan population is in immediate food need that there's a need for humanitarian assistance, for medicine, for food and other supplies desperately to get to the region. I call on all of those responsible to let the humanitarian aid go through. Otherwise, as we know from the UN, there are over 5 million people currently at risk of famine. This is an incredibly urgent situation and I will use my voice as a member of parliament to try everything that I can do to assist, to make sure that we are doing everything that Canada can do to prevent more atrocities. So again, I thank the concerned Tigrayan Canadians and I'm with you and together we will make sure that we don't see more human rights abuses, atrocities and even worse famine happening in the Tigray region. Okay, thank you for that. Um, and with that, let's continue with Professor. Alex my, my apologies. As you know, when you when you have a call from the the field in Tigray, you can't call back. So you have to you have to at least uh, uh, acknowledge it. Um, so the um, the destruction of five five full divisions of the Ethiopian National Defense Forces. Um, that is a blow from which the National Army cannot recover. It cannot recover. It cannot um, be on the offensive in Tigray. The only thing left actually for the National Defense Forces is to negotiate its surrender or withdrawal from Tigray. That is the basic fact. It will not come back. Um, there are, I, there will be in the coming days, you know, there are currently many thousands of prisoners of war. There will probably be several tens of thousands of prisoners of war. The equipment that was captured means that the, the Tigray Defense Forces is already deploying heavy artillery, anti-aircraft guns. It shot down a, a transport aircraft, military transport aircraft earlier today. The, this is a decisive turning point. Now, 
Um, I'm sure you're all familiar with General Tsadkan. I, I was fortunate to be able to speak to him earlier today. And he and I let me quote, he said, I would be lying if I told you that I expected this result. But we worked day and night to achieve it. And what he was saying was that, yes, they, they applied all the skills that they had um, in military organization to rebuilding the army from scratch over the last four months, building upon the, the skills and the commitment of the, 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 the Tigrayan officers and the Tigrayan people. They had many more recruits than they could properly train and handle. They were turning away most of the recruits who came. This, I think, was one of the major miscalculations made by uh, Prime Minister Abiy and President Isaias, which is that if you commit atrocities against people, hoping to humiliate and degrade them, you may actually motivate them to fight. And in this case, this is what happened. And because um, the, this generation of leaders who had left politics and left the military some 20 years ago, whom nobody could say were members of the TPLF government over the last 20 years, they were in, you know, in retirement or in their academic jobs or in, 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 in business. Or in the case of, of, of Tankan, who was also trying to mediate to prevent the war from breaking out. They rejoined, they put their skills and experience to work, and we see the fruits of that now. They did not expect the Ethiopian National Defense Force to crumble as quickly as it has done. Um, the, the question of when they take Makale is, is I, I don't know, but there is the, 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 but the, the capital is, is no longer credibly defensible by the, the forces that exist there. Um, one reason why they may not want to take it is a fear of aerial bombardment. The, the, the government of Ethiopia has, as we know, shown that it is capable of doing what the, the Derg did some 30 years ago and, and, and bombing civilians. Um, this leaves the, the question of Eritrea. The Eritrean Defense Force is more formidable. Um, it is now... Uh, matched, possibly outmatched by the Tigray Defense Force, but, it is, it, but there is a, a major question about what the strategy of Isaias will be and the strategy with of what Abiy will be. I think the events of the last week have demonstrated something that we all suspected for some time. Number one, that the, the Tigrayan resistance was undefeated and could not be defeated. And secondly, that the military imperial project that Prime Minister Abiy had embarked upon was doomed to failure. And it is now, he, that failure is becoming um, evident. And the question is now with his electoral success and the fact that, that the, the, the votes that have been counted are votes for the Prosperity Party and for him, he now is in a position where his decisions, whether to continue with his existing project or whether to change tech, the right or wrong decisions are his to take and he will be tested over the coming weeks. His first crisis, his first challenge as a newly elected prime minister will be to deal with his, uh, the route of his forces in, in, in Tigray. The equally important question that he will face will be Eritrea because we face the challenge, which is actually that those who study the history of, of um, Ethiopia as an imperial entity will recognize this challenge, um, this, this historical fact, which is that the, the imperial ambitions of Ethiopian leaders um, in the 19th century, in the 20th century, Menelik, Haile Selassie, et cetera, were facilitated by external assistance by guns provided by France and Britain, to, um, by support from the United States, and of course, in the case of the Derg, um, support from the Soviet Union. And as Yusuf was explaining earlier on, the external support in support of such an imperialist project now comes from this, um, this uh, alliance of dictators, this axis of autocrats, that is, essence. The 
project that Abbey, the military imperial project, is sustainable only if Isaias is fully committed to it. And the resources and capacity of the Eritreans, I think, are going to be, um, are, are in the coming weeks tested to their limit. And the question is, will Isaias recognize this? Will he adopt a different strategy? Because as the, the, the Ethiopian military capacity crumbles, if the Eritrean military capacity is withdrawn, then um, Prime Minister Abiy has the question, has the challenge, will he negotiate as an equal partner, let me repeat that, as an equal partner with the leaders of the Tigray Defence Forces, because that will be his only option. Um, the famine, the famine has been, is, is, is a tragic, preventable, man-made famine. Um, the, there are many reasons to criticize the, the years in which the EPRDF was in power. But on day one of the EPRDF assuming power back in May of 1991, the very first press conference at which the late Mela Sanawi spoke, he was asked by a journalist what was his ambition for his time in power. And he said, I hope that Ethiopians will eat three meals a day. And I think um, the, the achievement that cannot be taken away from the EPRDF was the conquest of famine in Ethiopia. Six years ago, when there was a drought on a scale unprecedented in Ethiopian history, 20 million people needed emergency assistance. The EPRDF government mobilized assistance, mobilized its own resources, it paid for 70% of that relief program. So it was generous, it was expeditious, and it was extremely effective. It kept farmers on their land. And it, and it meant that the greatest threat to food security in Africa at that time passed without any measurable increase in malnutrition and in deaths. If such a crisis were to strike Ethiopia today, the current government does not have that capacity does not have the financial capacity, does not have the infrastructure, does not have the standing with the donors, and does not have, I suggest, the political will in order to do it. And it is sadly because of, of, of climate crisis, not a question of if, but a question of when. And we know from the history of famine in Ethiopia, of food crisis in other countries, that they bring down governments. The famine in Walla was one key factor that brought down Haile Selassie. The famine of 1984-85 was one key factor that brought down Mangustu. And it was precisely for this reason that the, if we read the National Security Doctrine White Paper 2002, produced by EPIDF, they identified as the number one threat for national security, food security and poverty, not external threat. That was what they feared. And Ethiopia is in Tigray facing a man-made crisis of this nature. And any who think that that crisis will be confined to Tigray, they are deluding themselves. The black hole in the economy that is being created by the war in Tigray is sucking down the Ethiopian economy such that it is extremely vulnerable. This does not, this is looking ahead. How is the, the current crisis to be responded to? Because the, re, the tragic reality is that thousands of children will be suffering from starvation and most likely dying in the weeks and months ahead. The reality, the painful price of the the current situation, including the escalation in the military confrontation, is that humanitarian relief will be interrupted. The war was not the major reason for the famine. The major reason was the starvation crimes perpetrated by, particularly by the Ethiopian Eritrean forces and the Amhara militia. But as of now, with those forces, uh, confined to cities and in retreat, the major issue facing 
those who want to end this the crisis of hunger, the major issue is humanitarian access. So what are the immediate options that face the Tigray Defense Forces as they move into a militarily dominant position with a population of between three and possibly five million people directly under their control in the coming weeks and months? Tigray is, of course, surrounded. There is the option which will most likely be pursued by the governments in Addis Ababa and Asmara of enforcing a blockade. How would that blockade be broken? It could be broken by military means. Personally, I would not advocate that. I think that would escalate the crisis. I think we need to look at other options. One option that I think would be uh, worth looking at is the Operation Provide Comfort that was mobilized by the United States, Britain and France to support the Kurdish uh, regional authorities in the wake of the first Gulf War in 1991. When uh, the, there was the Kurdish uprising against Saddam Hussein, this, um, Saddam Hussein tried to come back. The humanitarian crisis moved London, Paris and Washington to do three things. First of all, mount a humanitarian airlift. Second, impose a no-fly zone. And third, recognize the de facto political authority of the Kurdish regional government, which then became a self-governing entity, not recognized by the world, but a, a functioning entity until such time as there was a change in government in Baghdad and the Kurdish regional authorities could participate in the democratic reconstruction of Iraq, of course, that didn't go very smoothly, but you will understand the principle. The last point I want to make is the failure of the international community. The African Union has failed dismally, and it has failed insofar as it has not only failed to act, it has abrogated its own basic principles, which were adopted in the 1990s and early 2000s in the wake of Rwanda, Congo, Sierra Leone, Sudan, etc principles like sovereignty as responsibility, the norm of non-indifference, the requirement of offering and accepting good faith mediation efforts. These have been trampled upon. And precisely because the Africans have not stood up for those principles, they, the UN Security Council has been blocked. It is absolutely scandalous that after seven and a half months, the UN Security Council has not had a single session on this. People will say that this is because Russia and China are threatening their vetoes. Well, if the Africans were to back a resolution, China and Russia would defer to the Africans. This is the way they operate. And China is actually deeply disturbed about the instability in Ethiopia. It may not care about human rights. It does care about state disintegration and instability. Russia, much the same thing. So those of you who, who, who have leverage or ways of raising this issue in Africa, especially in Kenya, Kenya is the, the most important country, member of the Peace and Security Council, the United Nations Security Council, and of course a neighbor, please do so because while the Africans um, drag their feet, this will be a major obstacle to, to international action. Thank you very much. I will, I will leave it at that. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Alex Dewan. Thank you very much. That was very rich and uh, broader uh, scope. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you to all the panelists. Now, uh, Giona, I think if you have questions that are directed to each of the panelists, please do so. If not, uh, if there are general questions that all the panelists could answer and indicate as well. So. Let's go there with the given time that we have to uh, shoot one of the questions that comes to the first. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Dr. Haile, and thank you, Professor Alex DeWall. Um, okay, so our first question is for uh, Yosef Uh The question is, what will be the uh, political future and the relationship between Tigray and Eritrea after this war is over? How do you see this? Um, ending for Eritrea specifically. 
All right, okay. Uh, it depends on uh, various variables. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, will the present uh, state of Eritrea, I mean, government of Eritrea, stay or not? Uh, that's uh, uh, one of the most important things. For example, uh, one of the uh, one of the things that I fear most about the way the West uh, has approached this problem is, uh, especially the European Union, if you have seen it in, in its latest, uh, 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 during the G17, for example, they have, I mean, uh, conspicuously, what was conspicuously absent was, uh, they didn't demand the withdrawal of the Amhara forces from, uh, from Tigray. Which uh, before on the on the on the I mean on the American side the U.S. side always they did emphasize the withdrawal of both uh, Eritrean forces and Amhara forces. To me, that particular it's a hint of uh, what's coming, what they want to come up uh, uh, after after this uh, crisis has been have been resolved has been resolved. Let me put it this way. On the Eritrean side, uh, there has not been a lot of pressure on the Eritrean side too. It seems as if uh, they, are, they want the Isaias government to remain intact, even after its withdrawal. The, the time it withdrew, it withdrew from Eritrea, they want, uh, from Tigray, they want it to remain intact. The question is, why do they want these things to happen? Now, uh, probably uh, part of it has been touched by uh, Alex, the fact that it could remain blocked, that Tigray could remain blocked. To me, when you, uh, what I suspect is that even on the Western side, on the West, they want to, uh, when, when the time comes on the negotiation table uh, for both Ethiopia uh, and uh, uh, Tigray come to the negotiation table. They want Ethiopia to have uh, empowered with all its cards intact. Ethiopia would be would have uh, would be uh, on on a, on a very powerful uh, position in that uh, negotiation table if Eritrea stays with all its power, even on the other side of the border, and the Amharas stay on the western part of Tigray, because having these two. Uh, having these two elements, you know, staying uh, inside uh, in, in their respective areas, it means that Tigray would have to compromise, for example, when it comes to, to cessation. Uh, 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 right now, there is a feeling that the Tigrayan people want a self-determination. If that is to be avoided, Tigray has to be weakened in many ways. And part of the plan is for Eritrea to remain intact in its hostile way. For example, a, fr a friendly Eritrea would completely turn this formula away because a friendly Eritrea means a powerful Tigray. And that they don't want it at this point in time because that would denote the cessation of Tigray. So th there is this, it's almost like a chess, chess game that we are looking at. So to me, it's, uh, uh, it depends on various variables on how the, uh, the relationship between Eritrea and Ethiopia comes. And it's very hard to, I mean, Tigray is going to happen. It's very hard to talk about it now, given these various variables. I will leave it at that. Okay, okay I understand. Thank you, uh, Yosef. Just to clarify though, uh -huh. do, you, do you see the future of Eritrean politics continuing in the direction that Isaias has set the country on? Or do you think there will be a change, of course? I mean, okay, if the, uh, uh, with, the, with the end of uh, the Isaias regime, I could see uh, a change inside Eritrea, with the end of Isaias regime. But the way it's set, the way it's set right now, uh, Shabia or uh, let's say the, uh, the EPLF or the, it has set it in such a way that for, the, uh, for, uh, for uh, Shabia to die, Eritrea has to die first. It's not as if, uh, I mean, you could separate the two 
uh, one from the other. Uh, I always give this example of a parasite, you know, that parasite is Shabia, which is inside the host Eritrea. It has been hollowing out Eritrea for a long time, demographically, economically, culturally, socially. It has hollowed the, uh, the Eritrea nation totally. In fact, what's happening now in Tigray is when the parasite hollowed out Eritrea, it has to find a different host in order to survive. That host happens to be Ethiopia and Tigray. So Tigray is being hollowed out by the same parasite. So to me, the way Shabia has has for uh, I mean has been uh, st have structured its uh, uh, its parasitical existence, it's almost like it's committing a double suicide. A double suicide, which is uh, it, whenever Shabia dies, then comes the death of Eritrea. So to me, it's a very I mean. Uh, uh, I'm being metaphoric in a, in a way that I shouldn't be at this point because it doesn't clarify a lot because we have to go into further explanation as to why I think that Eritrea, I mean, at this point in time, Shabia is committing double suicide. But I will leave, I will leave it at that, okay? <laughs> and uh, if there is a, a further questions, then uh, we'll, uh, we'll take it from there. That's great, thank you very much. Okay, the next question yeah. will be for Dr. Gabisa. Okay, so for Dr. Gabisa, the question is, do you see a possibility for a military or other kind of alliance between Oromo and the, the Oromo movement and the Tigray movement at this point, um, and possibly maybe Afa? That is a question from the audience. What do you think about this? I am not exactly sure if I'm the best person to, uh, to answer this, obviously, because uh, the theoretically speaking, obviously, uh, yeah, uh, not only do I see it, but this is necessary. It's, uh, it's, uh, people, we are in, in desperate situation from all sides, and there is enough uh, literature about this or experience and experiment from the past, uh, but the the, the challenge that can uh, can that can arise out of this is, you know, uh, how can how can this be happening in a world where uh, anti-ethnic group had been uh, perpetrated and socially mobilized? We need to overcome those difficulties. For us, for us to overcome those difficulties. Uh, we need to just do some genuine people to people reach out, uh, people to people uh, alliances, and then that can easily evolve into something tangible, credible among the fighting forces. And, and at some point, it gotta go that route. And that's when success can come. And for me, honestly, uh, what Tigray is going through right now is just unbelievable. I personally take this seriously. I went to Macaulay University, and some of the people who are now in the at the, receive, at the receiving end of agony are, or have been my professors, or it's I, I take this personally. And and but what is the the, tra the tragedy out of this is that uh, not proportional amount of uh, people to people interaction, even in the diaspora, is happening. Uh, and there are certain things that we need to compromise, that we need to overcome and make a higher choice that's acceptable to many, uh, to many of us. Um, okay, can I say something on that uh, question, uh, Dr. Henock? Uh, how do you examine in terms of the status of uh, the Oromia situation in terms of, we know how popular uh, uh, the movement, the Karo movement and so on were, and the expectation was there may not be any credible uh, election in Oromia after the withdrawal of Jawar Muhammad and Bakala Garba and so on. What is the situation exactly now and how do you read it? Is that movement kind of suppressed at a level where it cannot challenge the federal government or it's just simply going, the uh, OLA is really doing the job and it's just coming up. So it's simply, it's not in a position to stop it. 
How, how do you view that? What do you read? That's a very brilliant question. Uh, there are two ways to approach it. First of all, Abi, before he went to the Grai, he made sure that the social network and the social grassroots movement within the Cairo and within the Oromo had been dismantled one way or another. Uh, ultimately, that ended up in putting Jawar and Bakalegar back in jail, especially those who have been uh, at the forefront and who have been the face of the youth uh, grassroots uh, movement. So the, the challenge that right now we are overcoming is to re-mobilize that social uh, uh, protest. And that obviously had to uh, wait for moments and, and, and uh, it's, it, that's coming up as we all see. Uh, and second, uh, we also don't have to forget the fact that uh, whether this is a popular movement or an army struggle, which is the Ormo Liberation Army, these have been in, uh, in resistance for many, many, many years throughout the successive regimes. It's not like opportunities had been always available. It's not like material resources had been always available. Uh, that uh, needs to be grabbed. It's always been operating in a very limited uh, amount of, uh, of uh, resource, in a limited amount of, of uh, uh, political uh, opportunities. So uh, the way, uh, probably again, I am speaking about this as just a member of the Oromo nation, no any representation in or legitimacy to speak on behalf of the OLA. But what I can see is the rate at which Oromo Liberation Army is growing now uh, is pretty much unprecedented. Even some of us might be uh, surprised by how uh, the youth is joining uh, the Oromo Liberation Army. And there is a broader consensus that uh, uh, if, if the Imperial project had to be uh, unseated, uh, the best way to go is to remobilize uh, this force universally among the Oromo. But this does not come without a challenge. It has its own challenge. Uh, we are up against the state uh, that has a full-time resource and runs with billions. One competitive advantage that the Tigray people had, or, or the, the Tigray people had, is that they had, they had an experience uh, for the last many years. And it was easy to, as uh, Professor uh, Alex uh, Duval was saying earlier, for people like uh, uh, Arkan to put pieces together and rebuild the military. Uh, this kind of things does not come just out of nowhere. It depends on the pre-existing experience. Uh, but on the other hand, when we see the Oromo Liberation Army, they've been operating on a limited resource They've been operating on, on a limited political opportunity and they've been up against the state for the last many years. So these are uh, uh, some of the challenges, but the road uh, to any meaningful political settlement for the Oromo heavily and significantly depends on how OLA uh, 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 acts. And that's uh, an obvious uh, conclusion among, among the Oromos at the moment. Okay. Thank you, uh, Dr. Henok. Thank you. Uh, let me abuse my positions and while I'm at it. Uh, can I ask one question to uh, Professor uh, Alex Dualde? Respective of how the war in Tigray ends, what is, how is going to be the process in terms of dealing the stigma or the really the crimes that the government of Ethiopia has committed? Uh, do we have any precedents? Uh, we know we have the uh, Shavarniza and so on and so forth, but is there any defined process where you can deal or it's going to be, it depends how, how many times you really yell at or how many demonstrations you do or lobby you do, how does it work? Do, does the international community has a formula? If it ends this way, this is how it's going to dealt or just, is there any specific guidelines where 
what to do, how to do it, and when to do it in terms of how we address these issues. Thank you. Thank you. It's a, it's a big and important question. Um, <clears throat> the, the law is very clear. The, the law has been developed. So we have the Rome Statute we, and we have customary international humanitarian law, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it is very clear the laws that have been violated and that the individual perpetrators right up the hierarchy to the very top are, should be prosecuted for those acts, crimes, crimes against humanity, acts constitutive of genocide, et cetera. The question is how to do it. The, um, after the, you know, 30 years ago, after the overthrow of the Dirk, the, there was a special prosecutor set up, as you know. Um, the, uh, the prospect of that, I think, is, is at the moment remote. The International Criminal Court is also a remote possibility because it would take a UN Security Council resolution. Um, there are a number of of states that have universal jurisdiction, which means um, Belgium, France, for example, can you can you can prosecute individuals there. Um, and one thing that could, but before we get to prosecution, there are many other things to be looked at. And the first is documenting the crime scene. And one of the opportunities that arises now, um, as the, the, the perpetrators are cleared out of the crime scene, which is very important, is for those crime scenes to be documented. For those who are skilled in, in, in doing the investigations to get on the ground and talk to witnesses, photograph, et cetera, et cetera. Particularly the most difficult and sensitive ones are sexual crimes because it's into, you know, interviewing the, the, the victims, the survivors, takes a lot of skill and sensitivity. The second thing is, is, is simply recognizing the crime, just acknowledging that these crimes have been committed and saying to the, you know, the victims of starvation, the victims, the survivors of sexual abuse, this was not your fault. This is not something for which you should be ashamed for which you should feel degraded. This was a crime done to you and we stand, we believe you. One of the greatest insults that is coming from the government in Addis Ababa is saying, we don't believe you. Take it with a pinch of salt. It's exaggerated, making light of it. We must insist that the women and girls of Tigray are believed and affirm that every day. And then there's transitional justice mechanisms, telling the truth, compensation, restitution. Many of these crimes of, of loot and pillage, et cetera, there should be compensation, restitution. It should be required for the state of Eritrea to rebuild, reconstruct the factories, the universities that they have destroyed. And given that a lot of the construction, a lot of the infrastructure in Tigray was provided with donor money. It was the UK, for example, that paid for the water supplies in Makale and Adigrat, which have now been vandalized and looted by Eritrean and Ethiopian forces. The, the, the UK as a donor, should it not be taking account of this in its assistance programs to Ethiopia and Eritrea going forward? And I, it would be interesting to know what uh, Canada paid for, and, and in and which has been destroyed or vandalized in Tigray, and and therefore demanding the Canadian government. Well, is there not an obligation on you to ensure either that the Ethiopian and Eritrean governments rebuild it, or for you to 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 um, earmark your assistance to to Ethiopia in such a way that it rehabilitates? And what has been lost. So there are many other issues in justice as well as, 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 as prosecution. Thank you very much, uh, Giona. Uh, we can still squeeze some more questions. So go ahead, uh, uh, select the questions that you think are forward. Thank you. Uh, next question will be for Yosef Gavrihuat. Um, so as, a, as an Eritrean, 
the question is, how do you understand the relationship between the OLF and the Sharia regime? Uh, Isayas hosted the OLF for decades, ostensibly to support their resistance efforts. Um, and since they have returned to Ethiopia, we see war in Oromia, we see Daoud Ibsa apparently has been on house arrest uh, and is running out of supplies. So how do you understand the beginning and the end of this relationship with Eritrea? What happened? Okay. <clears throat> Here is a phrase that I have uh, that I think many Tigrayans liked it. Uh, the phrase was, uh, vulgar pragmatism. Vulgar pragmatism means Sha'abiyah is the most pragmatic organization in the entire area, uh, in the entire uh, Horn of Africa. By that I mean uh, the kind of vulgar, uh, the vulgar prag pragmatism is, it only asks, uh, okay, can I get away with it? Yeah? And at the same time, uh, there is no principle that guides it. There is no ideology that guides it. For example, when it helped the, uh, the uh, Al-Shabaab, it was not sharing their ideology. Uh, there, there is no, uh, there is no uh, ideological affinity with, uh, with Al-Shabaab. To the contrary, uh, it was wiping out Islamic fundamentalism in Eritrea at that time. So whatever relationship it makes, that's what it makes. Even from, uh, from even when it was in the uh, uh, in the media of Eritrea, uh, for example, when I hear uh, many of the leaders of uh, uh, TPLF, for example, when they talk uh, Sad Khan, uh, le, uh, recently Sad Khan and many Hello. other and many other generals were uh, uh, talking, uh, they were having an interview, and they always nostalgically mention their relationship with former Sha'abiyah while they were in Eritrea. They remember uh, the kind of alliances that they had. While on the Sha'abiyah side, there is not an iota of nostalgia, not none at all. It's pure vulgar pragmatism. So to a Sha'abiyah, it doesn't matter whether OLF now is uh, with it or against it, or for example, the way it started was in Asmara, of course, because it had all kinds of, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, guerrilla organizations in Asmara, because all that it was thinking was, how am I gonna undermine the EPRDF? That is the sole thing. Now, when it has done its job in undermining EPRDF, some of the elements that it has been helping have turned out to be a liability at a certain point in time, because they are at this point in time, they are working against Abiy's dictatorship, and therefore it, ha it goes against them. So what I'm saying, even now, when it makes relationship with uh, Ethiopia, some of the Eritreans confuse. I have heard some Eritreans saying that he's going, uh, he's going to federate with Ethiopia and things like that, which is all bullshit, because none of that is going to happen. No, no, he doesn't have that at all in, uh, in uh, I mean, uh, Isaias doesn't have, doesn't care at all about Ethiopia. All that he cares is how does, I mean, uh, how does Shabia, the organization that he leads, survives it all. That's all that he cares about. He might make miscalculation as he has made miscalculation in Tigray right now, huh? but there is no emotional or political or any kind of, uh, 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 goal when it comes from uh, uh, the, the Eritrean regime. The very idea, for example, this alliance of uh, uh, dictators that has been uh, created by uh, Isaias has that element in it. There is no ideology. There is no anything of any kind of affinity in between the three. Uh, he could easily turn against uh, Ethiopia or against uh, Somalia next time. So that's how I see it anyway. All right. Thank you very much. All right. Would either of our panelists like to add to this question? What happened between the OLF and Sharia? Maybe okay. Get okay. Show, maybe Henok. Huh? I can say something on this. Please. I completely agree with uh, our fellow uh, uh, 
colleague here, uh, what he mentioned. Uh, what does Isaias want, want out of this? When he decided to host OLF, obviously Isaias was, uh, had his own political issue with Ethiopia. So any, anything that stands against uh, the existing regime or the state of Ethiopia at that moment uh, is a resource to Isaias. This is how he thinks, obviously. That's how politics works too. And even he decided to host Gimbot Sabat. Gimbot Sabat apparently is the force that wanted to restore Eritrea back into Ethiopia itself. So uh, this is undisciplined, unprincipled uh, kind of political practice. And apparently it's working for him. He is the force of, uh, he wants to be the force that uh, wreaks havoc in the Horn of Africa and that worked for him. When OLF went back home, uh, returning uh, to Ethiopia in 2018, particularly on uh, 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 September 15, 2018, uh, that's when uh, actually for many of us, that's when OLF itself was liberated because he wanted the weakest OLF, the OLF that can only exist with no any significant implication or outcome. And one of the biggest disappointments for Isaias now is something that he might be preparing himself for is uh, how to further have a hand in the operation of the OLF. Uh, and the movement of the Eritrean troops deep down into the Oromia might be uh, a harbinger of what Isaias want to do or how he want to address uh, this problem. The fact that uh, OLF had been given a territory in Eritrea is actually uh, had a positive implication for the Oromo because that was the only territory that was available. But at the same time, he made sure that they only can exist virtually with no serious implication. He wanted to use them as a boogeyman. Uh, but the reality right now is obviously different. And if there is any enemy next to, uh, next to Tigray or TPLF as an organized uh, entity, it's OLF that's the enemy of Isaias. And that's what we are witnessing in Wolaga area with some of the captured uh, members of the Eritrean uh, forces. So that dynamic is actually very interesting. It requires something that all of us should uh, delve into in, 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 in the future. Great, thank you so much. Okay, we have time for one final question for Professor Alex Duval. So the question here is uh, about the African Union and IGAD. So do you see a constructive role for these two institutions in bringing the parties involved in the conflict in Tigray and elsewhere in Ethiopia to the negotiating table? Um, do you see a productive role for IGAD and the AU? No. Is there another question? I can easily answer that. No. Okay. They, 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 they are dead at the moment. Then I will ask you more broadly about how you understand, how you think the, the war in Tigray will end and what will happen with Ethiopia in future. There are talks of secession. There is obviously Abi's desire to create a more unified unionist kind of Ethiopia. Um, so where do you see this going? I think um, what is interesting about the current moment is actually you know, two, the, the realities have all come into focus at the same time. You know, the Tigray resistance is undefeated. The Eritrean state is at an existential point of decision. Uh, the military imperialist project of Ethiopia cannot succeed. And Abiy has a personal mandate from the electorate. They're actually, the election results were quite surprising. All these other opposition, including Isema, including the, 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 the Amhara nationalists, were wiped out. It's, it's like it's the sort of result that the EPRDF used to get, you know, 95% all to one party. So now it is Abiy's mandate. And the question is, can he rise to the occasion and actually reverse course? in order to save Ethiopia from what is otherwise a, 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 an inevitable disassembly 
into its constituent parts. He doesn't have long. Okay. Can you say disassembly? Uh, Is disassembly. that disintegration? I, 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 yes, disintegration, disassembly, they mean much the same thing. Okay. All right. Thank, okay. thank you, Professor. Okay. Uh, can I ask my uh, probably last question? Uh, this is to uh, everybody who can answer, really, not only to uh, Professor Alex Duval, uh, but uh, to everybody. Now, one of the uh, striking issues in terms of which is really bugging probably many Tigrayans is in terms of the issue of why the UN or what do we have to do in order to convince the UN or to force the UN or whatever the case may be for it to apply no-fly zone or other measures that would stop the government from attacking the civilians, the population, or it really destroys some of the cities that we have, whatever is left of them. Is it too late or do we give up or do we have to really yell loud, cry loud? And what do we have to do in order to convince the international community that enough is enough. The people cannot really bear all the atrocities that have, been ta that have taken place and more, and there are going to be more as the government becomes really desperate and it's going to be desperate in order to simply as a vendetta, even though it may not get anything in terms of recovery or bringing those soldiers again. So what do we have to do as your advice, A, to the international community, to the specific countries that are becoming, what do you, what do you advise that we do or others do in order to do? You hinted at it early on, but I, I want you to really expand as a take home really for all of us what do we have to do? What's the next step in terms of really addressing this issue? Because it's an existential issue for in many ways, because as long as we don't have the planes, Tigray is going to be vulnerable, even at the last day. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, I, I'm opening this to everybody for an idea, but I'm, since you hinted it, I'm redirecting it to uh, Professor Alex, if you can. Let me be very brief because I think we are, we are really uh, out of time. And, but I would say one thing, which is that the, on the international level, the analysis, the narrative is set. There are just a few who are pushing back, but they have lost the, the as it were, the, the battle for understanding the crisis was won. It was won several months ago. And the reason it was won was because of the facts. The facts spoke for themselves. There are some in the Ethiopian government who say we need better stories, but they don't. They need different facts. And they are trapped by that facts. So the it I know that the international response has been very, very slow. But actually, if you compare this crisis with other crises, it is the way in which the key governments have moved has actually not been so slow. It was usually much, much slower. And so maintain the pressure, maintain the campaign, maintain the, the sense of urgency and, and the next steps will, will follow. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I, I don't think we have uh, any more time that we can spare unless the others have uh, something to contribute to the questions that are asked. Uh, I'll give them the, the last chance to Milita, Dr. Henok, and uh, Yosef. Uh, if you have any anything to add to the questions, please uh, free. This is probably the, the last chance. Uh, that you have. So let me uh, give this uh, chance to all of them if they have any anything to say as a final point. Okay, uh, I would like to uh, say uh, briefly two points. Uh, to me, it's uh, now uh, much more important what we shouldn't do 
more than what we do. For example, when it comes to Abi, uh, uh, there is no, there has never been a way of convincing a genocider while he is in the midst of genocide. Genociders always want to finish their job. That's how they are set. So, to me, uh, for uh, one of the uh, one of the biggest uh, 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 errors the West has been doing is trying to convince Abi uh, uh, in order. Uh, nor I mean, trying to convince Abi. They, they, they have taken a longer time to convince Abi. Their gradual, incremental pressure is uh, is meant is uh, is designed to meet somehow. Uh, on the back of their mind, there is an abbey that can be reformed, that can be salvaged. So that thing should stop because he's not going to stop. No genocider have ever been, have ever stopped in the middle of genocide and unless he, f he faces defeat. So that's one, number one. And number two is uh, on the one on uh, the, 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 the one he raised on the uh, issue of uh, 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 no-fly zones. I think the West should take it upon itself to uh, conduct a no-fly zone instead of waiting for the UN uh, to do the same thing. Uh, because uh, again, you know, uh, hoping that the UN will uh, will do this will again be against. In both cases, what I am seeing is, you see. Uh, the, the, the humanitarian crisis in Tigray eh, doesn't give us time. Doesn't, even if the world, for example, as Alex has said, have been, I mean, briskly uh, converted or, or convinced of what is going on in Tigray, but the humanitarian, uh, the humanitarian crisis is being accelerated more than that. More than that. That's why, for example, it doesn't match at all. The way the West is responding and the way the humanitarian crisis is accelerating as two different parts. They are going in two different ways. Anyway, uh, that's the least, the small thing that I want to add. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Enok Milet. Uh, if you have uh, any last minute uh, thoughts, please. I don't think they have any more words to add. I wanna say thank you to our panelists, everyone who participated in this webinar and to all of the guests and listeners who have been asking questions and have been very engaged in the chat box. So thank you very much.